So after giving you yet another weekly dose of my patented cynicism, I know some of you are probably ready for another positive game review, and so I was sort of mulling it over, and I believe I read in a comment on the Starfield video talking about Red Faction Guerrilla. And I thought about it for a while, I had played the game a few years ago, and yeah, honestly, this might be the perfect game to talk about right now, because although it is a deeply flawed game, it offers something unique that very, very few other games have even attempted, and probably no other game has pulled off as well, and that being World Destruction. You can destroy literally any building in this game. And I probably really don't have to explain this, but physics-based destruction is just inherently satisfying. Now, like I said, this is a flawed game, and part of that is because, well, it's a middleware game, and middleware budgets often come with some major caveats. They gotta cut corners in certain areas, especially with a game as ambitious as this one was at the time. And so, before I get into this further, do the things the algorithm likes. God, I am so tired of saying that phrase. And I'm sure some of you are tired of hearing it, but the fact is, people do hit like and comment if you tell them to like and comment. So, I appreciate it. And without further ado, let's liberate Mars. Now, normally I would talk about gameplay mechanics first, but truth be told, most of them are not interesting or unique in any way. On the surface, this game handles like pretty much any other cover-based third-person shooter you played at the time. Gears of War had released three years prior, and so the game industry was flooded with a bunch of copycat cover-based shooters, and just one year before this game, Volition had released Saints Row 2. But unlike Saints Row 2, the guns all feel incredibly weak. It takes multiple headshots from any of the starting weapons you pick off of EDF forces in the beginning of the game to kill a single basic enemy. So let's just ignore the shooting for now and talk about the main highlight of this game. And I'm probably going to state this at least 10 times over the course of this video. But you're here to blow up buildings with a bunch of different tools, and the reason why it's so fun is because of the Geomod engine, which simulates realistic destruction, and I say realistic in quotations. It's about as realistic as you could expect for 2009. So let's talk about some of the tools that you use to destroy the world around you. The first, and probably the most iconic given it's in the logo, is the sledgehammer. The sledge contains a mass multiplier servo, which is essentially techno babble to explain why you can smash concrete and steel girders within a few swings, and also send any humans flying that you hit with it, which will always be funny. I honestly really miss ragdoll physics. I wish they were in more modern games, but I guess they break your immersion and everything is about realistic graphics now, which is very boring. So being a demolition man, predictably you also have access to remote charges at the start, which do exactly what they sound like. You can place down a certain amount of them and detonate them all at the same time to level a building fairly quickly. And honestly, just these two tools will probably keep you entertained for the first five hours. Blowing up stuff, smashing people with sledgehammers, picking up the enemy's weapons and using them against them makes for a pretty okay gameplay loop. But of course, that does get boring eventually, so as you might expect, there is a progression system. Thankfully, it's fairly simple. There's only one currency in the game, Salvage, and it is obtained by doing basically any activity in the game. And you use Salvage to purchase new weapons, upgrades for those weapons, armor upgrades, enemy locations on your radar, even the ability to fast travel, so it's safe to say it's pretty important to collect as much of this as possible. So early on you get access to the rocket launcher, which, I mean, it's a rocket launcher, it works exactly how you would expect. But as you get further into the game, you also unlock upgrades that allows you to shoot three at once and give it heat-seeking capabilities. There's various different jetpacks, which unfortunately I didn't get a chance to use all of these. Like I implied earlier, at a certain point in the game you're going to want to start saving up your salvage, because you can't really afford to dip your hands in every pot 
most of the weapons in this game have an upgrade path, and you're definitely not going to be able to upgrade everything to max unless you do all of the side content, which trust me, this is one game you absolutely do not want to 100%. But what I can say is that the thrust jetpack option is absurd when it comes to destroying buildings. So it's more or less what it sounds like. It's a quick burst upward that can function as a super high jump. But what you're going to likely discover the first time you use this thing is that while it's active, you're completely invincible. And this applies to jetpacking straight through buildings. Even materials that are normally extremely hard to destroy, you can jump straight through them like they're not even there. And as it turns out, after looking this up, none of these backpacks were available in the single player in the original release of the game. They were added in with the Remastered Edition. Yes, you heard that right. Remastered. And honestly, I'm really glad to have all these items in the single player, seeing as I'm probably never going to play the multiplayer. But there was definitely no thought put into balancing these for the single player. They're both highly unbalanced and also weirdly cheap, and you can buy them from basically the beginning of the game. That being said, it is a lot of fun. The next toy you get access to isn't available until about halfway through the story and is tied directly into the plot, that being the Nano Rifle. As the name implies, it shoots nano machines, which disintegrate anything it hits in a small radius. This includes humans as well. So this thing is pretty much good at everything. One hit kill on soldiers, can destroy the stronger supports on buildings in just a single hit. And if you hit the wings on one of these VTOL jets that are normally super annoying, it instantly spirals out of control and blows up, which is a pretty nice touch. And the last tool in your arsenal is the Thermobaric Rocket Launcher. It's basically a mini nuke, which is obviously pretty awesome the first time you fire it, but it only has four shots and you don't get access to it until near the very end of the game. And yeah, that pretty much covers your main tools in your arsenal. You have four inventory slots, one is permanently taken up by the sledgehammer. So you're essentially trying to balance the last three between demolition tools and hopefully one gun to carry around with you. My advice, take the Marauder shotgun. Despite being something you just find on the ground from one of the enemy types, it's probably the best gun in the game, requiring no salvage to upgrade and actually one-hit kills enemies even on hard difficulty, which is what I played it on. Personally, I would not recommend playing this game on hard just because a lot of the side missions don't feel balanced around it, and you can die extremely quickly. There's no invincibility frames or damage buffer, so if 10 or more enemies are shooting you at the same time, you can die pretty much instantly. And I can feel some of you itching in your seats, ready to click on that next video. So I'll try to wrap up this section fairly quickly by talking about the various tools in the sandbox that'll help you on your grand vandalism quest. Of course you can drive cars, this being a sandbox game, but unlike pretty much every other sandbox game, you can use these cars to drive straight through buildings. Again, I don't think I need to describe why that's fun. How many other games can you do that? On top of these basic vehicle types, some of which have guns on them, you also have access to tanks and mechs. Now the tanks are all controlled by the enemy, so you're going to have to use the Arc Welder Gorilla Weapon, which is probably the only non-demolition tool that is worth the upgrade investment, because what it allows you to do is electrify enemies inside of vehicles, which is the only way to kill enemies inside and hijack the vehicle. And of course this includes tanks. No explanation needed, pretty effective. But what's even more effective than that are the mechs. I've described other things in this game as overpowered, but the mechs are truly what breaks the game. They have an absurd amount of health, and although two types only have access to melee attacks, they smash buildings like they're not even there. There's no resistance. The heavier mech type can literally walk through buildings. The only attempt at balance here is that the mechs only spawn at certain fixed locations across the map so you're probably only going to use them during story missions or a select few side missions. But yeah, these are fucking awesome. There's also a couple other unique weapons that you just find out in the world. The first are the Moabs. You find four radio tags. It marks a thing on your map. 
you drive over it in a car and it turns that car into a nuclear bomb, basically. I didn't feel like searching for collectibles in a giant map, so I only actually used this twice throughout the campaign. But I suppose if you're a completionist, you'll get access to a bunch of these. And the other one are these singularity bombs that you find in random points. These are essentially remote charges that explode after a certain amount of time and are kind of like a black hole bomb. They suck in stuff, then they blow up. Obviously really powerful. And that just about covers it. If you're the type of guy who's bored by me listing out things, forgive me. There really wouldn't be much of a video here if I didn't. Because, again, put quite simply, what you're doing in this game is you're blowing up buildings because you're a commie terrorist. I mean, sure, the game may frame it under socialism, quote unquote. But I mean, just look at the Red Faction logo. Come on, they knew what they were doing. If you're gonna put socialism in your video game, at least put the most effective type, National Socialism. YouTube, that's a joke. Please don't demonetize me forever, please. Another thing that keeps this game interesting throughout is that enemies can also destroy buildings, whether they're using grenades, their tanks, the Gauss weapons they get access to late in the game, which are actually highly annoying because unless you turn off screen shake, they literally knock your reticle off the target. But because they can destroy buildings too, this is a true example of emergent gameplay. Normally I don't really like that term because it's kind of hard to define what actually creates emergent gameplay, but this is a really good example. Because you can be standing on the second floor of a building shooting some guys, they blow up the railing you're standing on, you fall, the shit collapses on top of you, and you have to like skitter behind cover to regenerate your health, or the opposite can happen, where there's enemies standing on top of a building, and you just blow up the floor below them, or collapse the entire thing and they fall to their deaths. And again, to emphasize the point I've been driving home here, this is a very unique experience to this game. It turns what a very possibly could have been a bland third-person shooter into a completely unique and fun experience. Unfortunately, it's probably the only part of this game that is unique and fun. Pretty much everything outside of destroying buildings is boring. And so we transition into the worst part of this game, which is the sandbox. I probably have a reputation at this point for not liking sandbox games in general, and it's true. I'd say 80% of the time, an open world in a game actually detracts from that game, or at least is just too large to be interesting. And yes, unfortunately, the sandbox does detract from the experience quite a bit. But, at the same time, I have to say, if this was a linear game, it would certainly be less interesting. And I can say this with confidence, because the fourth Red Faction game, which was a direct sequel to this one, was a linear game. There's no open world in Red Faction Armageddon, and that was not that great of a game. The beauty of the destruction mechanics is that, theoretically, they should make the open world more engaging simply because you're able to destroy that world that you're exploring around. This was basically what the premise of Crackdown 3 was supposed to be. Crackdown 3 will blow up the way you play games today by introducing a revolutionary new multiplayer experience using 100% destructible environments. Now, all this cloud computing technology stuff turned out to be complete bullshit, which is why the final game was nothing like the initial reveal, but Red Faction Guerrilla essentially fulfills that promise that Crackdown 3 couldn't on a much smaller scale. The problem is, most likely due to technical limitations at the time, this is a very empty open world. Of course, there are small little pockets, little highlights, where you blow up factories or military installations or government offices. But of course, when 90% of the rest of the world is empty, Volition knew they had to fill that with something, and that something is, of course, side missions. The thing is, as you could probably guess, these are the worst side missions Volition has ever made. Saints Row sort of has a reputation for them being hit or miss. These are mostly miss. There's like one legitimately good side mission, that being the Demolition Master, which, as you can expect, are timed demolitions and they give you a specific tool to destroy that building in a certain amount of time. So it's kind of like a puzzle. 
Usually the puzzle solution is blow up the supports as fast as possible, but they can get a bit more complex where you'll have to use throwable explosives in the map, or maybe you only have three or four shots with the nano rifle or a handful of remote charges, etc, etc. The point is, the Demolition Master minigame is fun enough that I did all of them and beat all of the pro times. I wish I could say the same for the rest of these minigames, but yeah, they mostly suck. I don't need to break them down in detail, but I'll describe a few to get the point across. Timed Vehicle Delivery Rescuing prisoners while infinite enemies spawn outside following a courier to a destination. Almost all of it is boring shit like this. The only other debatably good side mission is where you get to use either a tank or a mech to destroy as many enemy vehicles as possible, but even that lasts way too long. One of them lasted over five minutes for me to complete. So between these side missions, and the collectible ore that you have to mine, and the various destructible crates in these EDF military areas, makes for one of the most generic, bland sandbox experiences I've ever had, outside of actually just destroying buildings, which is awesome. So you might be wondering, what about the story missions? Well, unfortunately, they're not that great either. The best ones in the game are basically just an extension of what you're doing in the sandbox. Go to a location and blow up the buildings there. Of course, there's a story reason for why you're doing it. Doesn't really matter, to be honest. The story in this game sucks. I'm not even going to cover it because it just annoys me. We're talking about, in the course of 50 years, a bunch of scientists from a mega corporation that used to rule the planet have turned into savages like this is some kind of post-apocalyptic world and they're led by two women. I'm not gonna rant about sexual dimorphism in a fucking Red Faction guerrilla review, but let's just agree to disagree on the differences between men and women on this one. And that's not even to mention that some of the original scientists would obviously still be alive 50 years later, so how would they let their children become a bunch of morons who attack their enemies with sharp sticks? I think Volition just wanted to have like a Mad Max faction in their game and tie it back to the original, but this just doesn't make any sense, not nearly enough time has passed. And the funny thing is, this isn't even the story itself, just the backstory of the main story. And the narrative itself is incredibly forgettable, I've already forgotten most of the details and I've just finished the game. Basically, you're just playing as Troy Baker, and your brother gets killed right at the beginning of the game, and you join the Red Faction, which are a bunch of crazy, commie, murderous revolutionaries. So it's a good thing the EDF are cartoonishly evil fascists, so you don't have to feel anything. And over the course of the game, you cause billions of dollars in property damage. I mean, you're just a glorified domestic terrorist. And you kill hundreds of Earth soldiers who probably have families, so it's a good thing they're wearing generic armor and you never see their faces. And you get the point, eventually you liberate the planet at the end, harnessing the power of the nanotechnology that the old Ultor scientists developed. So to get back to the actual story missions, like I said, they're just kind of generic, and the ones that aren't generic are usually terrible. There's one in particular that, I don't know if this is just a bug with the remastered version of the game, but during one of the missions, the EDF bombards the area with mortar strikes, and you have to do 10 separate objectives, of which you have to complete every single one. If any of the people you have to rescue or any of the files you have to comb through get destroyed by the random mortar strikes, which they can be, I don't think they're supposed to, but it can happen. It happened to me multiple times the first time I played this game a few years ago. I got lucky this time. Then you just fail the mission and have to start over from the beginning. And that brings me to another problem. This game is a lot like Jack 2, and if you play Jack 2, you already know where I'm going with this. There are basically no checkpoints for any of the story missions except for the last few that are especially long. So if you die, you can very easily lose 15 to 20 minutes of progress. There's one near the end of the game where you literally have to drive across the entire map with no fast travel, I mean it's literally just a setup for a big plot twist, but they make you drive around in an empty wasteland for 10 minutes building up to that point. And even the final mission really just isn't that good. It commits a game design sin of just 
throwing as many enemies as possible at you for a sense of spectacle. And you do get access to a tank that has rapid fire rockets, which is cool, but if that tank gets destroyed, you will die instantly, trust me. There is no survival if that tank gets destroyed. So yeah, it's a mixed bag to say the least. Any mission where you're just blowing stuff up or killing a select few people is cool because it gives you player choice, you can approach the situation however you'd like. And destroying the buildings is fun, like I've said probably five times this video. But pretty much any of the gimmick missions are bad for one reason or another. And so, before I get to the conclusion of this video, I did check out the DLC expansion, which comes with the remastered edition, called Demons of the Badlands. And it's essentially a mini sandbox that is a prologue to the story, and I actually already explained basically what the story of this is earlier. You play as the female protagonist, Samanya, who, in the main story, you just know as a genius engineer. Well, it turns out she's a super badass, like Alec Mason, aka Troy Baker number 57. And you find out the backstory of the Marauders and the, all that old tour scientist bullshit. And you fight the EDF and kick them out of the Marauder Valley, setting off the events of the main story. So you'd think it's just more the same? Well, in reality, it's actually better than the main game in some ways. Mainly that the progression system is even better, because they completely got rid of salvage, and made it so you just unlock items by completing the few story missions, and doing all the side missions, which you'd think would be a bad thing, except they've reduced the side mission types to just three. That being the Demolition Masters, which are actually even better than the main games, because now they're pretty much all puzzles. Some of which were actually pretty challenging, and I actually welcomed that increased challenge because it didn't feel unfair. Unfortunately, the second main type are the vehicle delivery missions, which are probably the worst side quests in the game. And then the third type is you basically just kill some guys, so that's completely fine. But what makes it a better progression system is that you unlock something new with every side mission completion, and there's only 11, so you unlock things incredibly fast, and in this DLC is the best weapon in the game, the Missile Pod, which is essentially a rapid-fire rocket launcher that can hold over 60 rockets and kills any infantry in one shot. It's a shame this wasn't ported over into the main game with the remaster like the multiplayer weapons were. Given the sheer amount of enemies that this game throws at you at certain points, you really need this thing. The only downside with the DLC is that it's only about two hours long, unless you decide to 100% it. But if you like the main game, this is more of the same and it's quite good and probably the closest thing to a sequel you're ever going to get. Which brings me to the conclusion. Should you play Red Faction Guerrilla? Absolutely. It's a great game doesn't mean that you should finish it. The main problem with this game is that pretty much anything not involved with destroying buildings sucks. The shooting sucks, most of the side missions suck, probably about a third of the main missions suck, and even the ones that are good are just more the same sandbox gameplay, just with a little bit of story driving you. And all of these things could have easily been fixed with a sequel. Unfortunately, Red Faction Armageddon is not that sequel. But again, like I've said several times already, destroying the buildings is super fun. It's something that you can't really do in any other game. And while the physics certainly aren't perfect, you'll notice that buildings can stand on just one corner, and it just looks ridiculous. For the most part, it's just really enjoyable inherently, and will at least keep you entertained for 10 hours. So certainly pick up the game cheap, give it a try. This is something I think will appeal to pretty much anybody, so you might be wondering what happened to the Red Faction franchise. Well, despite being developed by Volition, the IP was owned by THQ. And if you remember right, THQ went out of business, and a bunch of its IPs were sold off to other companies. Deep Silver picked up Volition itself and the Saints Row franchise, but didn't purchase Red Faction. So once THQ Nordic was formed by former Darksiders developers, they purchased the rights to Red Faction, and we really haven't heard anything since. I mean, they made the remastered edition of this game. But in the last few years, THQ has proved that, at the very least, they can remake some of their old games from back in the day, and are still making the Darksiders franchise. So maybe Red Faction will get revived? I hope it does. I think most of the good games I've covered on this channel are unfortunately from franchises that are either dead or have declined. And this is yet another dead one. And what got to survive? 
Saints Row, and just look at the state of it, man. I've made three videos covering it, two of them got age restricted for being too edgy. And don't you worry, I'll still be reviewing it when it comes out, but I might have to be more careful with that video for obvious reasons. This is probably the shittiest ending I've had to a video yet. I think the next video will probably be like a generic rant style thing, because I need to start prepping for the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 review, considering I have at least two games to play before then. Uh, that's about it though, I'll see you next time guys.